so what we're going to do today is we're going to jump into uh, the section of scripture that we're looking at. We're going to uh, kind of take a detour as far as we're going to find out what wisdom is all about, right? Because what Paul does in this passage that I'm about to read is he contrasts heavenly wisdom with earthly wisdom. And I want to ask the question, what's he mean there? And how can we know what real wisdom is? And so if you would open your Bibles again to verse 6 of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, we're going to go to the end of the chapter, which is verse 16. And I'll go ahead and start reading it, and we'll jump into today's study. It says in verse 6, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it's written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thought of God, thoughts of God, except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, in order to fully understand this passage, right, because there's a lot of wisdoms and there's a lot of spirits and all these kinds of things that can be kind of confusing, what we have to remember is that Paul is writing to a church that is in distress. This church in Corinth is all kinds of messed up. If you remember, uh, there's sexual problems. There's all kinds of problems with the way that they ate together. They practiced the Lord's Supper, not just by dipping a little bit of bread in some juice, but they actually had a meal together, and they enjoyed each other's fellowship. And the intent was that this meal be not just for the elite of the society, but also for the people who were poor. And what was happening is, come on up, Chuck, you can preach. Um, what was happening is that the meal was getting distributed. So we're going to go ahead. Yeah. So the meal was getting distributed, and uh, some people were eating, and, and, and it, was, it was just uh, like a, a mess, right? Like they were eating, gobbling up all the food before the poor people could get, get there. And this was causing divisions, right? There was racial tensions, the Jews and the Gentiles or the Greeks. Uh, there was all kinds of problems. So Paul is writing to this church and he's saying that, hey, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a spiritual issue. We need to understand what wisdom is all about. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss today's theme, which is we need to discern what wisdom is because Paul is going to return to the issues that we talked about last week. I won't, re I won't uh, just because of time, I won't revisit all those different issues, but he's also going to uh, return to this issue that wisdom comes from the spirit of God. Now, um, I want to kind of take a little bit of a detour because um, when I used to read this passage, one of the things that was confusing to me was that wisdom of uh, the earth seemed to be contrasted with heavenly wisdom, and I was always confused by that, right? Um, especially because it seems like wisdom's just wisdom, no matter where it comes from. Is Paul suggesting here that there's a different kind of wisdom? Well, I think what he's saying is that there are purported forms of wisdom, right? Like there are people who purport to be wise, but they're actually foolish, and then there are people who are like, look, I am no genius, but I know this. And they have this sort of grandmotherly-like wisdom where it just makes sense. Their actions are, act like some of the things that they, they do are just right and good. And they might not have a PhD, but if you're like me and you spent any time in academia, a lot of times the people, especially in the social sciences and especially in the liberal arts, the people who have PhDs are usually dumber than rocks, right? And, and God bless them, right? But it's just, it's just shocking, you know? And they, they are, they are self-purportedly very wise, but they're, they're, they're not actually, right? So 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to survey, and we're going to put a bunch of verses up on the screen, and we're going to have kind of a, a just a, a, a kind of a, a lightning round of what Jesus and the apostles say is wisdom. Now, in John chapter 17, which I'm going to read verses 13 through 19. Uh, here, I, I want you to remember this is in the upper room. This is where Jesus is doing the so-called uh, upper room discourse where he's praying for his uh, disciples before he leaves, before he goes away. And he says there, but now I'm coming to you. He's talking to God the Father. This is his high priestly prayer. And he says, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, right? That's where the, 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 the concept, you know, or the shirts or whatever, not of this world come from, right? Just as I'm not of this world. Verse 15, I do not ask that you take them, that is the disciples, out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Who's the evil one? Cool, yeah, it's devil, yes. All right, and then verse 16, uh, they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring up this passage is because Jesus and the rest of the disciples and the turned apostles who wrote the New Testament seem to set up this really confusing um, uh, idea that like, hey, we're, to, we're to love the world, but we're not supposed to be in it. Or we're to um, be for the people of this world, but not really like for it. It, it, ju it just gets really confusing. And so what I want to do now is I want to just present the tension that Jesus kind of presents in this passage, right? That we are to be fully immersed by culture, excuse me, fully immersed in culture, that preposition really matters, and yet not defined by it, okay? So that's what Jesus' intention is for his disciples in John 17, and that's what his intention is for his followers in the 21st century, that we are to be fully immersed in culture and yet not be defined by it. Okay, so what does the word world mean, okay? Well, I wish that we could say it's simple, just go back to the original language, but the word for world in Greek is simply the word cosmos, okay? And there are three different senses that I want to highlight today. Now, what I mean by senses, I'm going to give you an example of the English word course. I do this a lot because it's a great example, right? What if I say, man, what a great course. What could I, be, what, what could I mean by that? Group participation. Food, absolutely. What a great course that I had on the cruise. You know, it was, it was, the first course was amazing. Second course, not so much. All right, good. What else? What, what a great course. What else could I mean? Wait, someone said what? A yes, a class. Exactly. Right. Yeah, what a great course. I learned so much. Okay, good. So we got food. We got course. Joe, go ahead. Sports, sports, like a golf course. Absolutely. Golf course. Man, I really stunk on that course. It was a great course, but I, I yes, exactly. So you see there that there are three, at least three different, uh, we could go on, but uh, senses of the word course. The way that we have to interpret that word then is through the context. Does that make sense? Same English word vastly different meaning. In the same way, the English word world and the Greek word behind it can have different senses. And we're going to define now what that means. The first sense is the earth or the created order, right? This is what we find in Genesis 131, where God saw all the world that he had made, and it was very good, right? So the world in that sense was good. Now, if we keep on going, obviously this is still like uh, in Acts 17, we got, um, got the God who made the world and everything in it, right? That like God created, he tenderly, lovingly cultivated the earth with it just teeming with potential. And of course, it was like a good thing. But then there's the second sense of the word cosmos. That's the inhabited earth, the human community called the nations, right? This is what we find in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, which is Mark's form of the Great Commission where he says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. The word world there refers to this sense, the inhabited earth, the human community called the nations. Same in John 3.16, right? The one ubiquitous verse that almost everyone, even some unbelievers don't know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
But there's also a third sense, okay? And this is a sense that can get a little bit confusing, right? This is the, uh, the sense of the word world, which kind of designates the organized system of human civilization that is actively hostile to God and alienated away from him, okay? So we find this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. You can see that I've highlighted, italicized, and bolded a lot of different words, or a lot of different worlds there, right? Do not love the world. Well, wait a minute. I thought God loved the world in John 3, 16, but he's meaning here in the third sense. Do not love the world or the things in this world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Wait a minute. Are we supposed to love it or not? It's all the sense, right? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from, and instead of the, reading the word world, I'm going to substitute, is not from the Father, but is instead from the organized system of human civilization that's actively hostile to God and alienated away from him. Does that make sense? Perfect. James 4, verse 4, uh, the, the first part of it. You adulterous people. Thanks, James. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? In other words, friendship with the organized system of human civilization, you get the picture. Okay, so in sum, then, we have the sense that means, hey, this is the earth, this is the created order. In the second sense, we have the inhabited earth or the human community called the nations. And then in the third sense, we have the organized system of human civilization that's actively hostile toward God. Now, what's the big point? Like, what am I getting at, right? In the third sense of the word world, that sense does not mean all of non-Christian culture. Because what I want to try to establish is this. For far too long, I don't know if you were anything like me, I know that I had a unique upbringing and uh, my parents loved me and, and, and they, we, I was raised in a Christian household. Um, but one of the things that I learned from an early age is that the world is scary and that the world is kind of opposed to the things of Christ. And I need to be very careful. And anything that was Christian was good. And anything that was marked non-Christian or even maybe secular was bad, right? And, and of course, I'm referring to the fact this is when I was like five or six and I was not very discerning. And as I got older, I started to question those assumptions. Because here's the thing. Are there things that are marked Christian that are absolutely opposed to the ways of God? Yes. Absolutely. Just turn on TBN, right? I mean, seriously. Are there things, though, that are, that are, that are designated as non-Christian and are actually, like, really um, amazing, compelling pieces of literature or art or music or theater, or, 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 or movies, or whatever, that actually can communicate longing and communicate like something higher and better. Yes. And, and, and so what I want to do is I want to say for far too long, the people of, uh, of, of God, especially in the Western world, particularly in America, have for too long been like, okay, if this is marked Christian, we're going to stamp a cross on it, and we're going, to, we're going to market it, and it's going to be good for everyone. And everything else, non-Christian, we're not going to support, and we're not going to be a part of. And that's just not what Jesus has called us to do. Jesus has called us to be missionaries, to be fully immersed in the world, but not defined by it, right? And so the wisdom that Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians is the ability to discern, Right? So wisdom means that we stop labeling things as merely Christian or non-Christian, and we actually learn to discern things. Now, I hope that this is going to be a liberating study. I also hope, here's the thing, I hope to get you thinking at the end of the study, the goal is not for you to disagree, is, is just to disagree, excuse me, agree with me. My goal is not for you to be like, yeah, right? I might actually challenge you in a little bit and might like make you feel like, I'm not sure that I buy every single assumption. That's fine, right? Because I want you to think about things a little bit more. And I want to present from scripture the way in which the missionaries of God, particularly Jesus, who was the sent one, he was the sent one, that's the way that John describes him. He was sent from the father and then he commissions and sends his apostles. That's all apostle means, by the way. 
Disciple means learner, mathetes, right? And in Greek, the word for apostle is apostolos. And then all it means is sent ones. Now they're commissioned to go. And what are they commissioned to go and do? To be missionaries in the world. And in order to do that, they're going to have to accept some things, even though there was around, there was around that time no label of Christian and non-Christian, and they were, they were to discern. So I hope you guys are with me. Now, here is what we want to try to do. We want to try to hold, fa- excuse me, test everything and hold fast to what is good. That's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Now, let me go ahead and fast forward some of the things that Paul's going to talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says there, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Notice Paul's language here. Paul is like the ultimate missionary, right? He says, To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as those outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win, uh, win those outside to Christ. And then he continues on. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And I do it, I do all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. Now, I want you to think about this just for a second, okay? This is, God has an interesting sense of humor. Um, Paul was the most Jewish, when he was Saul, he is the most Jewish of Jewish disciples, right? Like he is, he, he lists his credentials later on uh, through the New Testament and, and, and Jesus knocks him off of his horse, literally, and says, hey, you're, 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 you're going to follow me. And he goes and he becomes a, um, a, a missionary and a church planter to the Gentiles. Like, this is absolutely hilarious. Like, only, only God could do this, right? So, when he talks about winning those under the law, when he talks about becoming Jewish, so one of the things that was like a big deal if you're Jewish, and, and actually I, I want you guys to, like what, is, what did a Jewish person do around the time of the New Testament in order to show their Jewishness? What did they do? How did they, how did they live? How did they live set apart lives? Follow the Sabbath. Follow the Sabbath, absolutely. So we could say like they had a unique calendar, right? Because they followed the Sabbath. Think about that. Every, we, we're, we take it for granted that we have five working days and like, you know, usually Saturday and Sunday off, right? Um, but uh, days off in the ancient world was not a thing until the Jewish people said, oh, we, we want a Sabbath. Great. What else did they do? Follow the Mosaic laws. Follow the Mosaic laws. Absolutely. Yep. I'm sorry. Did someone say? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. And is that what you said? I'm sorry, Brian. Festivals, absolutely. So Sabbath and festivals, ate a kosher diet, followed the Mosaic laws. What did you do to young boys, right? Circumcision. Circumcision. And in a, in a culture that was very public, right, like public baths and stuff like that, that definitely set you apart. I'm not being crass here. I'm being serious. People, Romans were like, what in the world? What, like, this is manipul- this, is, this is terrible, right? So think about all these different things that you would do as a Jewish person Paul doesn't reject those things because he's a product of that culture, right? But like when he's around the Gentiles, he's not compelled to keep kosher. He's not compelled to have all these festivals because he knows that his uh, expression of fidelity to Yahweh does not come through following these things, but rather his adherence to his discipleship to Jesus. Does that make sense? But when he's around Jewish people, he has a completely different modus operandi. He has a completely different way of operating. And so in the book of Galatians, we'll read that he'll say, hey, these Judaizers, they tried to circumcise one of my followers and I didn't even give them an inch. I would not allow them to take one inch because if you do, the implication is they'll take a mile. But in another instance, in the book of Acts, he says, oh, actually... In order not to stumble the people, I circumcised one of the followers. Why would he do that? Did he change his mind? He did it because the mission depended on his ability to discern. Does that make sense? Okay, so so this is a big thing. When he says, look, 
I'm free from all, but I've made myself a slave. We have in our English Bibles usually servant. The Greek word there is slave. Isn't that an interesting juxtaposition? He's free, but he's enslaving himself to Christ. And he's doing that so that he can win over everyone. And so when people would point their fingers at him and say things like, Paul, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves or yourself. He would say in the book of Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation, right? Now, we are called to be missionaries just like Paul. And we're called to discern. And so, how do we discern? How do we, how do we make the choice between engaging in some aspects of culture and rejecting other things? Because just as there are some parts of culture that express longing and, 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 and have beauty and, 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 are, and are compelling, there are also parts of culture that are downright antagonistic to the things of God. Would you agree? I mean, th 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 there, there are things that we need to, to stand up for and to be like, no, this is wrong. This is, this is not correct. And it, our moral authority depends on it. So how are we going to, uh, how, how are we going to respond to, to these challenges? Well, there are parts of culture that we need to, number one, receive. There are parts of culture that we need to reject. And then there's parts of culture that we need to redeem. Now, let, let's, let's look at these in turn, okay? So parts of culture that we need to receive. And, and I'm very helped, by the way, from different theologians and different uh, contributors who have, who have uh, uh, helped me come up with some of these verses and things of that nature. But parts of culture that we need to receive. This is from 1 Corinthians 3, which we're actually going to see this next week. Paul says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. What he means by that is you guys are acting like babies, right? Spiritual babies. You have no maturity. If I fed you with milk, and he's talking about spiritually speaking, he had to dumb things down for them because they were not ready for solid food, right? And even now you're not ready. Verse 3, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? See, Paul's bringing this back up. If you remember from last week, he addressed this, but he's saying this is a big deal. This strife, this division, like this is a big problem. You need to be able to receive that, there, that the, the wisdom that like Christ is not divided, right? I'll also say this, that um, uh, this is from Acts chapter 17, verses 27 through 28. This is possibly one of the, the more uh, amazing examples of how we need to receive from culture um, different uh, d different truths that maybe don't have a cross stamped on them or aren't found exactly explicitly in the scriptures, okay? So Paul is at the Areopagus, right? And part of the reason why I read the previous verse is he's talking, he's talking now to, he's, he's talking it to Christians before and he's saying like, don't be divided. And now he's talking to Gentiles. He, he's, he's preaching and he says in the middle of his speech, he says that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way uh, toward him. Yet he's actually not that far from each one of us. For, and then he quotes, he says, in him we live and move and have our being. Even as some of your own poets have said, for we indeed are, of, are his offspring. So Paul, in scripture, actually quotes a Cretan philosopher, Epimenides. Right? For in him we live and move and have our being. So was Epimenides a Christian? No, he, he, was, he was on the scene of human history far before Jesus was, and he wasn't influenced by Christianity at all. And yet Paul says, oh, that's a good idea, that's true, we take that and we receive that as truth. Does this make sense to you so far? Okay, great. And we're going to go on, right, uh, but... but it, when he says, um, for we indeed are his offspring, this is from Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, that, that second part, that's from a Sicilian philosopher, Aratus. Okay, so he quotes two different people and he says, look, if it's true, if it's beautiful, if it's good, we receive it. Now, this one's an interesting one. Perhaps you've read this and this is like a really confusing verse, but Paul later on in Titus in verses 12 through 13, he says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And it's like, wait, this isn't our Bible? I mean, this is so strange. And then he goes, 
This testimony is true. You know, it's like, wow, thanks, Paul. But here's what we're getting at, right? He's actually quoting a Cretan philosopher, Epimenides. He's quoting another person, right? Like a, 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 the, the same uh, person as before. But he's saying, this is true. And, and by the way, I think the reason why it's true is, isn't this interesting? It's a self-refuting statement, right? If a Cretan says that Cretans are always liars, then if it's false, it's true. And if it's true, it's false, right? And Paul says, well, this statement in this testimony is true. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll debate that later. But isn't that interesting, right? Or in Jude 9. Now, Jude only has one chapter. So in Jude verse 9, he says this. And I love this. He just sort of assumes that we know about this, right? He's like, you know, you know what I'm talking about. When the archangel Michael, he contended with the devil and he was disputing about the body of Moses. He didn't presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And I just read it and I go, Wait, where does it say that? What, like, did, does anyone know, right? Well, actually, that is actually from a pseudepigraphical, yes, that's right, big word. If you want to impress your friends on 4th of July, say pseudepigrapha or the pseudepigraphical book, The Assumption of Moses. It's not in our Bibles, but it's interesting because what uh, Jude does is he takes parts of a tradition that was longstanding and he says, look, this is true and it's found in our Bibles. So here's the thing though, we need to receive truth that is truth on the face of it and truth outside the scriptures will never ever contradict truth inside the scriptures. So let me say that, say, say that a different way, right? I, I can't tell you how many um, times when I was pastoring young adults especially, right? Young adults will fall in love with anyone that walks through the door, right? <laughs> Like, oh, God told me that that's the person I'm supposed to marry. And it's really interesting because sometimes God will tell them to fall in love with people who are already married. <laughs> and I just say, okay, wait a minute. I'm so sorry. Wait, <laughs> let me just clarify for a second. God told you to instigate a divorce. Well, yeah. yeah. Hey, man, I don't think that that was God. I think that might have been the meatball sub that you had last night. <laughs> Or the evil one. Like, and, and, and we're teasing, but it's like the truth of God says, look, like, uh, like th these are the parameters for divorce, right? Like this is how it's supposed to work. Not because someone is feeling all lovey-dovey because they found someone who, you know, meets their every need. The truth of God does not, uh, like, let's say like the spirit of God, right, will not lead you to contradict something inside scripture. And likewise... Here's the thing, like for you college kids or for you people who are going into college or for those of you who are interested in the, in the, in the, the humanities or, or, or the sciences, if you find truth outside, if you find truth outside of scripture and, it, and, and, and it's beautiful and it's true and it's good, then claim it, it's yours. You don't have to just have it be a Christian truth in order for it to be called truth. And I hope that that is clear. We need to receive parts of scripture because if it's good, if it's beautiful, if it's true, then you can claim it as yours. But we also need to reject parts of society, right? There are clear examples uh, in parts of non-Christian culture that we need to reject, right? Like, for instance, I, I, I don't say here we need to reject singleness, but there is an idea that um, is prevalent that, you know what, if you're single, then like your job is to explore sexually. Like that is your like you would hurt yourself if you weren't abst if you were abstinent. Like you your job so to speak is to have as many experiences sexually as you can. And we say to that, no, that's not true. That's that's not that's an idea that we need to reject. Like people laugh at self control and abstinence, and we say no, that is the that is. That is important. That's a virtue that we want to uphold. And likewise, like the rampant greed. And by the way, there's rampant greed inside of churches, right? Like, like it, just because people are putting a cross on it and saying, you know, uh, God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And if you give your money to me, you too might also have a yacht and, you know, a 10 million square foot house in, you know, LA or something. You know, it's like, no, we reject those kinds of things, whether it has a cross on it or not. And we also reject, we were talking about this in men's group yesterday, we reject the idea that the uh, driving impulse of our heart when it comes to when someone wrongs us is revenge. Like we reject that. 
our culture loves to celebrate um, books and movies and things where people get even. And we say, no, that's not what we want. We don't want that. So I have a list of questions. And again, I am indebted to a lot of different scholars for this list of questions. It's not original to me, which is why you should trust it more. Okay. So I want to just ask these questions. And again, I'm going to move through these at lightning speed. But I want you guys to think about them. And if you're interested, I'd be glad to, to, to send them to you and to, you know, to distribute them. Because I've, uh, freely I've received, so freely I'll give, right? So um, I, I want to I just put forward, how do we know if we're supposed to receive something or reject it? Well, maybe this grid will help, right? Is it beneficial to me personally and to the gospel generally, right? That question uh, is, is kind of, it finds its roots in 1 Corinthians 6.12. I don't have time to read it, but I encourage you to, to, to look up that passage. In other words, you know, there are certain practices that might actually help you share the gospel. There are certain things that, that, that might actually, like, um, uh, endear you to the community of people that you're reaching out to. Now, this is a big challenge for me personally, right? I'm a chaplain in the military. There are people who want me uh, to, to uh, for instance, like, uh, when I was deployed, people were like, hey, chap, why don't you come? Why don't you watch some movies with us? We'll hang out. It'll be a good time. And it was really helpful for me because I was really lonely at times because I was like, man, I miss my family. Um, I'm, I'm away from them for a year. There were certain times where I would, I would go, and it was such a beautiful time of fellowship and just getting closer with this group of guys that I was hanging out with. Great time. But there were times where they would play movies with sex scenes. And I was like, I don't need to be a part of that. I don't need to see that. For me personally, that would cause me to stumble. I don't want to be a part of that, and I would leave. And they always understood. They didn't you know, uh, make fun of me for it. They didn't tease me for it. If anything, it probably gave me a little bit more moral authority because I wasn't like, oh, you shall not do that. It's like, look, for me, like, I, this is not something that I want to engage in. But there have also been times where um, I, I, I might have had to, um, I, I might not have been inclined to participate in an act um, like before uh, in, 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 my, in my pastor kind of role, but because I'm a chaplain, I, I'm like, I'm going to participate in this. And none of it's been sinful. None of it's been like, you know, uh, in a gray area ethically. But because the gospel demanded it, and because I had an opportunity to present to people who might have otherwise never been open to hearing the gospel, I did so. You know, that's what Paul is talking about. He's like, to the Jew, I became a Jew. To the Gentile, I became to a, a Gentile. To the weak, I became kind of like Phil Colbertson. Like, it, I'm just kidding. I just wanted to get a dig in because he was teasing me so much yesterday. So revenge is, is what I'm all about. So no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. All right, but uh, the second question, will I lose self-control and be mastered by what I participate in? Right? I mean, this is a really important question. So, for instance, like, there are, there are, there's, there's a lot of Christians that believe that, that, that there's, there's no problems with drinking, right? So I was raised in a household where uh, my dad was uh, an alcoholic, and uh, alcohol was an absolute, like, no, don't do it kind of thing. Um, I don't have that struggle, and I don't have a problem personally with having maybe, like, a glass of wine, right? But, like, there becomes an issue when if you have to have fun... You're downing six, seven, eight glasses of wine, or you're, uh, you're, you're engaging in sort of like uh, crazy uh, drinking socially. You have to wonder, wait a minute, is my freedom being used as an opportunity to enslave me? Does that make sense? And, and, and I, I want to just say, like, this is a big cultural issue, right? So, like, in public, it might be best for me to re refrain from drinking, so when I go out with uh, my friends, like after an exercise, we're all in civilian clothes. Uh, this is when we were in Fort Indian Town Gap, Indiana, uh, or uh, anyways, Pennsylvania. That's where it was. And we were, uh, we were all in civilian clothes, and everyone got a beer except me. And could I have had a beer? Absolutely. I would have had no problem with it. It wouldn't have caused me to stumble, and I would have been just fine. But I didn't do it because alcohol is an issue for some of my soldiers, Right? And so it's all about, look, if I participate in this, will it help me? In some cases, you might make an argument that it might, right? If you're in France and it's part of the culture, or if you're in another part of the world where it's, it's, it's customary to drink, not excessively, then you might question that. But in my context, it wasn't. 
All right, so is it a violation, this is the third one, of the laws of my city, state, or nation? This is an important one because it's kind of assumed that Christians will follow the law. Except Paul says it's okay to speed every once in a while. He said, <laughs> no, he doesn't, he doesn't actually, I'm teasing. Will I be doing this in the presence of someone who I know will fall into sin as a result, right? So again, the drinking example, you know, or, uh, or smoking, right? I mean, um, smoking a cigar or something like that, you know, oh my gosh, are you going to hell for that? You know, but it's like, but if someone's trying to quit smoking and they have, I mean, just about everyone in the military almost has like a vaping addiction or like a, you know, smoking cigarette. It's like, well, do I need to participate in that to like be one of the guys? Or would it stumble someone? All right, let's go on. If I fail to do this, will I lose opportunities to share in the gospel? This is an important question just as much as it's important to ask, look, if I do this, will I lose an opportunity? If I, if I don't do this, right, if I don't, you know, join someone in, 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 their, in the activities that they're doing, Am I going to, to uh, lose an opportunity to share in the gospel? I'll share one uh, instance where I, I think I epically screwed up, okay? So this was, uh, again, a two-week training. And uh, at the end of it, I had made friends with a lot of uh, lower enlisted people, right? And um, as chaplains, you're totally fine to do that. Usually they don't want you to kind of mix with, with, with the lower enlisted if you're an officer. But these, these, these soldiers needed love and they needed care. And after about a two-week training, uh, I was in my car. I was uh, getting, arriving at the unit and I was reading my Bible. Someone knocked on my door and said, hey, Jeb, we're going to go over here. Do you want to come? And I think they were going to go to breakfast. And I was like, uh, you know what? I'm good, man. I'm going to do my devotions. And then like literally like 10 minutes later, I was like, I don't think I should have done that. I think I should have gone with them. I think that that invitation could have been divine. Now, they weren't going to go to a strip club. They weren't going to go to a bar. They, weren't gonna, they were going to go to breakfast. And afterwards, I was like, I just missed an opportunity, didn't I, Lord? Like that, dang it. You know, like that was, that was a missed time. So if I fail to do this, will I lose an opportunity? All right, another question. Can I do this with a clear conscience? Right? Acts 24, 16, right? Everything you do, strive to have a clear conscience. Will this cause me to sin by feeding sinful desires? Actually, this one can be an interesting one, okay? There are certain, there are certain um, things that we can participate in our culture that will lead to feelings of discontent, right? So I'm kind of being, like, facetious here, but I also want to, like, challenge you. Like, there are certain... Um, channels, right, that like are solely dedicated to me being discontented about my little condo, right? <laughs> HGTV. It's of the devil, right? No, not really. I'm, I'm teasing. No, is HGTV bad? No, but it's like if it's causing me to feel like, oh, gosh, I don't have, I, don't, I just don't have much, you know, it could be feeding an evil desire of discontent. So, that's just me, and now you guys know all my neuroses and all my, you know, problems. But am I convinced, this is the last question on this one at least, that this is what God desires me to do? That's a good question. When you're filtering through the grid of how do I discern, does God really want you to do this? And we're almost done. Does my participation proceed from my faith in Jesus Christ? Right? In other words, is this a result of me wanting to further the gospel? Am I doing this to help other people, or am I just being selfish? Right? Um, and a, an example that I tease about a lot is I really, really, really want to start a yacht ministry because I want to reach out to all those multi, multi millionaires. So, will you buy me a yacht? You know, it's like, nah, it's probably just me being selfish, right? Um, and can I do this? This is the last question. Can I do this in a way that glorifies God? Okay? So, the reason why I showed you those three slides of whatever. 12 different questions is because we need to discern whether we reject things from society and culture or we receive them. But there's also, if you remember, the third alternative. Sometimes we need to redeem things from culture. And how do we redeem things? Well, we're called to embody the alternative. And here's where we're going to land the plane, friends. Right? So we're thinking back to the idea of like what we reject, right? In terms, of, in, in terms of sexuality, right? And, and yes, I'm going to talk about sexuality. Don't start blushing, all right? But like, you know, the culture perceives us as Christians, by and large, to be very prudish, to be very against sexuality, 
and to be very sort of like, oh, gosh, no, like we, that's not us. We don't talk about that. But we're called to embody that real, like wonderful, like monogamy can exist. Like we're not called to be anti-sexuality. We're called to be pro wholesome, like, like beautiful, like, like God honoring sexuality. And, and I know that for some of you, you're going, is he really going there? Yes, I really am. But like, can I get an amen at least? Amen. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I, this is such an important issue because so many people believe that sexuality is just a no, 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 no thing. But I mean, if you go back and you read the Song of Solomon, let me just tell you, it is patently false to interpret that as just an allegory of God's love for, for Israel. That's not what it's about. And likewise, it's not about God's love for the church. It's about a man's love for his wife. And it's a celebration of fidelity between two lovers who get married and who are able to celebrate each other's bodies. Are you taking notes? <laughs> But like, think about this for a second. I mean, this is so, this is so important, you know? And, and I just made Phil blush so bad. I'm so sorry, Phil. But no, I, I, I say this because it's like, man, we need to embody the alternative. What about, what about greed, right? We reject greed, but we embrace what? The proper stewardship of resources. I, I can't tell you how many people are absolute messes with their finances in the name of being generous, right? They're outwardly generous and they blow their finances. And when it comes down to it, because of their inability to manage their household well, they're a drain on like, the rest of their family and they can't really bless people when it comes to, down to it. I mean, we're here to embody the alternative that yes, like I'm, this is not mine. I'm called the steward, but I'm called the steward well. And, and, and what about like, you know, just friendships? I mean, the deepest friendship that you see in scripture is David and Jonathan. What a beautiful, and, and, and in, in church, guys tend to be the most lonely people because they don't tend to have friends. We want to embody the alternative where it's good to have friends that you care about, that you long to be around, friends that support you and love you. We want to embody the alternative of all these kinds of things. So there are parts of culture that we reject, that we say, no, this is absolutely not of God. There are parts of culture that we receive, that we say, yeah, if it's good, if it's beautiful, if it's true, we claim it as ours. But the art of discernment then dictates that we need to be the kind of people who can also redeem certain aspects. And so when you have certain concepts that are portrayed on television or certain concepts that are portrayed in movies or in, um, in, in, in music or, or in art forms that we have an opportunity to speak into as a church. Yes, there are times where we need to stand and we need to say, absolutely, we reject this. Yes, there are times where we need to receive, but we always need to be mindful of that grid through which we can process and filter things so that we can redeem those aspects of culture that have largely been lost because God's people have been so focused on themselves and so insulated and so in the church and so outside the world that they have no relation to it. Because God has called us to be in the world, fully in the world, immersed in it, and yet not defined by it. And so, brothers and sisters, we're going to take home, the take home truth is this, right? And I, I just want you right now just to close your eyes, if you would. Close your eyes as we, as we uh, are about to close in prayer. And I want to ask you the question, right? In Romans 12, 2, Paul says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so I ask the question, how many times are we conformed to this world? How many times am I conformed to this world? How many times have I, in an attempt not to be conformed to this world, I actually become conformed to a pattern of thinking that's not even really godly, even though it's plastered with the cross? My admonition, my encouragement for us all is that we might be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and we can do that by testing and discerning the will of God.
Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to discuss what real wisdom is. Because real wisdom you've given to us, it's such a, um, an amazing thing to be able to have the Holy Spirit and to, to, to call on the Holy Spirit and to ask, Lord, uh, for your wisdom. But you've also given us common sense. You've also given us um, uh, almost a heightened awareness through your Spirit of what it is that we need to, um, to, to try to, to, to do to discern, to understand what things we want to hold on to and what things we want to reject. But Lord, help us to be those who redeem also. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, we, may we respond in truth as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Right. So um, I have this benediction for you. If you would um, just maybe in a posture of reception, just be reminded of the beauty of these words as you hear from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And so go in grace and peace, brothers and sisters. God bless you and have a great Sunday.